Good morning and welcome to today's Housing Supply Summit 2022, Solutions to Build More Homes, hosted by the Residential Construction Council of Ontario, RESCON, and sponsored by the Toronto Regional Real Estate Board, the Federation of Rental Housing Providers of Ontario, and the Canadian Centre for Economic Analysis. My name is John Michael McGrath, and I'm a columnist and podcast host at TVO.org, uh, the digital side of things at the province's public broadcaster. Before we get underway, I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking with you from the lands currently called Toronto, but traditionally home to people such as the Haudenosaunee, the Mississauga of the Credit, the Huron-Wendat, and others. The Toronto Purchase, by the way, only saw a final settlement agreement signed in 2010. Some municipal councillors, MPPs, and MPs from that year are still in office. This is not ancient history, and it's not something to be forgotten. We are here today to talk about making it easier for people to find homes, and we can do that while remembering whose home we are in. The topic of the day is housing supply, and for good reason. The rapid increases in home prices that started as a Toronto problem earlier in the last decade have now become an Ontario problem and a Canada problem. People who are able to are moving further and further away from the largest concentration of jobs in the country, enduring long commutes, or simply giving up on working in Toronto at all because the cost of housing makes everything else impossible. This comes with real costs to families, to businesses, and to the provincial and national economy as a whole. And like so many other things, the pandemic has only exacerbated trends that started long before it. The ability for some households to work from home anywhere in the province or the world has seen places with small housing markets suddenly be flooded with new people and new money. This is not a simple problem or one with a single cause, but numerous jurisdictions around the world from California to New Zealand have tried to tackle housing shortages by making it substantially easier to build more homes faster. And Ontario may follow suit. Earlier this year, the province published its long-awaited report from its Housing Affordability Task Force, which recommended a number of measures to increase the supply of new market rate housing. That report is likely to inform, at least in part, a major new piece of housing legislation likely to be presented at Queen's Park only weeks from now. With the scene set, let me tell you what we have in store today. Our day will begin with a presentation from Jason Mercer, the Chief Market Analyst at the TRRB, We'll then have three keynote speakers, the Provincial Ministers of Municipal Affairs and Housing, Steve Clark, the Federal Minister of Housing and Diversity and Inclusion, Ahmed Hussein, followed by Jeff Lehman, the Mayor of Barrie and the current Chair of Ontario's Big City Mayors. We will then proceed to a series of Pecha Kucha sessions before we hear from the leaders of the opposition parties at Queen's Park. NDP leader Andrea Horvath, Liberal leader Stephen Del Duca, and Green Party leader Mike Schreiner. At 1 p.m., our, our concurrent sessions start with panels on numerous topics running until 2.20 p.m. or so, at which point Richard Lyle, the president of Rescon, will deliver some closing remarks. Through all of this, those of you watching online will be able to submit questions to anyone who is live with us today, uh, though regrettably that will not include the provincial or federal ministers uh, who submitted pre-recorded statements. Before any of that happens, however, Richard is also going to deliver some welcoming remarks to get us started. Richard, over to you. Thank you, John. Uh, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm Richard Lyle. I'm the president of ResCon. Uh, we represent uh, low, mid, and high-rise builders who build all forms of housing in Ontario. Uh, so the issue of housing supply in the current crisis is vitally important to our interests and to our communities. But before I begin, I would like to first recognize the extraordinary heroism of the Ukrainian people who are standing tall in the face of an unprecedented invasion by Russia. It's sobering to think that while we seek to increase housing supply here and improve access to shelter, it is being brutally destroyed elsewhere in an inexplicable human tragedy. We are all thinking of the valiant Ukrainian people at this time and will welcome Ukrainians to Canada with open arms. And there may well be tens of thousands of them. And so we will need more housing. Although the issue of housing supply has been on our agenda for two decades, it has deteriorated over that time and progressively become more critical as highlighted in the federal election campaign last year. Since that time, the issue continues to be a hot topic. There is no debate we have a housing supply crisis. The question is, what needs to be done to solve it? I would like to thank our partners and sponsors, Toronto Regional Real Estate Board, the Federation of Rental Housing Providers and the Canadian Center for Economic Analysis, as well as actual media uh, for hosting the event. I'd also like to thank Andy Manahan and Stephen Henderson for quarterbacking this event. 
We clearly need bold and decisive action to deal with the housing crisis. Housing supply by any measure is inadequate for our growing population and the many costs are soaring. The recent Ontario Housing Affordability Task Force report and its 55 recommendations are a critical step forward. The task force report provides an ambitious blueprint for building 1.5 million new homes in the next decade by revolutionizing how municipalities approve housing projects, as well as streamlining, digitizing, and modernizing the approvals process. Progressive out of the box type thinking is needed, but it is only the beginning. Today, industry experts will put forward their ideas on what needs to be done to solve the crisis. And I, for one, am looking forward to that. I'd also ask you to check out the WOVA platform library sponsor booth uh, and more while you're here. Recordings of the event will be available for, uh, in a few days and the WOVA platform will be open for 90 days. With that, I'm gonna turn it back over to John Mike McGrath. Again, thank you for being here. John, of course, you know by reputation and he has been very much involved in the ongoing issue of housing supply and affordability and so on for a number of years. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the summit. Thanks so much for that, Richard. Our first presentation from the day it comes from Jason Mercer, the Chief Market Analyst at the Toronto Regional Real Estate Board. Uh, Jason is going to get us all on the same page in the discussions to come, enlightening us all on the topic of macro policies and the housing market. Jason, take it away. Thanks very much, John, and I appreciate the invite from, from ResCon to include TREB in, in, in this event, uh, and, it, and it's very important. I mean, TREB just released its, uh, its February statistics today, and uh, you know it, it's a common theme that we've been discussing over the past number of years, and it's really come to a head um, as we've moved through the, the, the pandemic and seen a tightening um, housing market. Um, as, as buyers have taken advantage of, 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 of low borrowing costs and, and a quickly recovering economy. And, and so with that said, you know, we have a, a fairly short time frame today. So I'm going to jump right into the presentation. And my plan is to leave some time at the end to, uh, to, to answer questions that you can put through the WOVA platform. Um, and so first and foremost, I think it's important to... Well, I mean, excuse me, I'm just having a bit of a uh, issue with my screen share here. My apologies. There we are. My apologies for that. Um, it, I, th I think it's important to start off with, with a quick look at, at, at where we've been over the last couple of years, and particularly through 2021, uh, where we saw a record level of, of, of sales activity and certainly reached a new record um, in, terms of, in terms of average price. And so we saw over 121,000 transactions reported through TREB's MLS system last year um, and, and saw an average price obviously moving above uh, the million dollar mark GTA wide. And now it's important to note that you know, TREB's member realtors uh, play an important role in, in those transactions. And each year we have Ipsos uh, undertake consumer polling for us. And one of the questions we're asking is if you're intending on purchasing a home over the next year, um, are you intending to, to use a realtor in that transaction? And, and give or take a couple of percentage points, that's always hovered around 80%. And I'd argue, you know, at the end of the day, because of their, their close cooperation with, with builders throughout the GTA and more broadly throughout um, Ontario, that number actually ends up being higher as, as they cooperate with, with builders at the sales center to, to help clients who, who ultimately find their way into the, into the new home market as they move through their, their home search process. So it really is, you know, a collaborative effort. Uh, in the housing industry in Ontario, whether you're talking about uh, the resale housing market um, or the new home market. And certainly, you know, as we move through this presentation, we'll see um, that, you know, conditions are really tight in the existing home market and, and, and would certainly benefit from, from more building activity um, in, in, in the new home side of things. And it's also important to note um, that, that, you know, Richard mentioned it, um, and so did John in his introduction that, you know, we used to be talking about tight market conditions in the city of Toronto and then broadening out uh, to the GTA, um, but really it, it is a southern Ontario and even broader problem now today. Uh, and this chart, I think, bears some of that out, because what it shows in, in, in green 
um, is the, the number of transactions uh, that, that are reported in, in TREB's sort of primary reporting area, which is the, the Greater Toronto Area plus South Simcoe and Orangeville. And if you look at the, the gray bars and, and the red or orange line on this chart, it shows the share of transactions that our members have been involved in outside of that uh, uh, primary GTA area. And it's been growing over time. And I think that goes a long way to sort of show how that supply issue and how that affordability issue has been compounding um, over the time uh, to the point to which now about 25% of our members' transactions are, are have uh, spread out into the broader greater golden horseshoe. So I'm talking about the Niagara's and Hamilton's, Kitchener Waterloo, Guelph, Barry, you know, Peterborough areas surrounding uh, the GTA proper. And that just gets to the point where you have a lot of households uh, that are looking to purchase a home, um, but have been having increasing difficulty finding a home that meets their needs for, uh, from an affordability perspective. And they've broadened the scope um, of their of their home search over time. And so thinking about, you know, the trend for home sales over time, what this chart kind of points out, the, the orange line is where we'd expect to be based on average per capita sales over time as the population uh, continues to grow. And what we saw in, in, in 2021 uh, is, is that actual sales moved well above uh, that, uh, that per capita trend. And so what that means or suggests is that a lot of people in 2021 sort of pulled forward uh, their decision to, to, to purchase a home. Number one, you know, we're seeing improving labor market conditions. So that obviously spoke to, to strengthening consumer confidence. But on top of that, uh, buyers were also benefiting from you know, extremely low borrowing costs. And so looking forward to 2022, that's one indicator where we may see a little bit of give back in, in terms of home sales. And, and we have seen that over the last couple of months where you know, the demand for ownership housing has been very, very strong. For example, this past February, we saw the second best result on record only behind that 2021 result that we saw last year. Now, thinking about the future, housing demand is driven by population growth. And the population in the greater Toronto area and arguably the broader greater Golden Horseshoe doesn't grow but for immigration on net. Um, and, and obviously, as you move through the early stages of the pandemic, we saw a real dip um, in, in the number of people moving into Ontario from other parts of the world. It makes sense. We had you know, public health restrictions in place uh, in most countries around the world and obviously uh, very strict uh, uh, border uh, guidelines, border crossing guidelines as well. But as we move through 2021, we started to see a resurgence um, in, in, in population growth based on immigration. And, and that's certainly set to continue as you move through 2022 and 2023. It's a major tenet of the federal government's overall recovery program to see an increase in, in, in population to drive economic growth. But on the flip side of that, obviously, these people are all going to require a place to live. And Richard mentioned this at the beginning of his presentation, uh, um, whether we're talking about uh, the demand for ownership housing or the demand for rental. And again, Ipsos does consumer polling for us each year. And because of the importance of immigration and because of the anticipated acceleration um, in immigration as we move forward over the next couple of years, we asked a few additional questions um, on the immigrant experience. And what we found is that 38% of homeowners that were surveyed um, had immigrated to Canada at some point in time. And it's interesting. Uh, because if you look at the likelihood to purchase a home, purchase intentions as we move through 2022, you'll see here that while 11% of overall GTA residents said they are very likely to purchase a home, 14% of immigrant households uh, uh, said that they are likely. And so, you know, the, the purchase intentions are, are stronger for, Im for immigrant households versus the population as a whole. Similarly, if you look at the estimated purchase price, uh, we see that you know, the estimated purchase price for, for immigrant households versus total um, is higher as well. And so thinking forward, thinking about where population growth is coming from, number one, you're going to see above average purchase intentions um, as, as newcomers move to Canada and put down roots. And number two, they'll be looking at, at homes uh, uh, with, with, with values above average um, as we move forward as well. And so, you know, why is there this interest in, in moving into the greater Toronto area and broader greater Golden Horseshoe? And, and why are people confident in purchasing and, and paying for a home over the long term? Well, a lot of it's got to do 
you know, with our strong regional economy and diverse regional economy, creating jobs across a number of different sectors from goods production to high value added uh, services. And so, you know, it's a virtuous circle. People have moved to Toronto, they take advantage of the job opportunities that exist, and that attracts more newcomers uh, because there's a lot of different job opportunities catering to a lot of different skill sets that people have built up from all around the world. And that's expected to continue as you move through 2022, um, as the labor market continues to grow and continues to recover um, from the pandemic. And so that will continue to bolster consumer confidence in, in the ability to purchase and pay for a home over the long term. Now, yesterday, the Bank of Canada decided um, to start its rate tightening cycle. And this was you know, very much anticipated. In fact, there was some surprise that they hadn't um, started this cycle at their previous uh, meeting earlier this year. Um, and, and so obviously it begs the question, well, what impact is this going to have on the housing to market and, and the demand for ownership housing? And this chart is a little bit uh, uh, messy, but what it shows is that, you know, looking at bank rate tightening cycles over the last couple of decades, initially there is an impact. Uh, on average, you've seen sales drop off by about 11%. Um, once the rate tightening cycle starts. But even more interesting is that when you look forward, you know, two months after the start of that, or sorry, two years after the start of that, that rate tightening cycle, you see sales have actually fully recovered and even sort of moved above that pre-rate tightening period. And so what that means is that higher interest rates uh, don't preclude people from purchasing a home over the long term. What it means is that some households who may be right on the margin of affordability simply take a step back and resituate themselves in the market. So they may be looking at a different home type at a lower price point. They may be looking further afield, and we've already discussed this, further afield in terms of geography um, in, in, in surrounding suburban regions. But by and large, these households do move back into the market. Um, and, and so while uh, interest rate hikes, higher borrowing costs may provide a bit of relief on the demand front, that relief will be short term. And, and we certainly will come back to the supply issue if it's not solved moving forward. The other thing is, is that, you know, uh, uh, the, the great majority of households actually have a lot of built in flexibility to deal with higher borrowing costs as we move forward. And again, another quote, one of the questions that we're asking um, through our Ipsos polling each year is, you know, how much down payment are, are, are you using to, to purchase the home, uh, to, to, to purchase the home you're intending to buy over the next year? And, and overwhelmingly, we see that, you know, that, that, that average down payment is representing around 30% of the overall purchase price. And the great majority of people are at that, certainly at that 20% threshold um, or above. And so that means that there is a lot of flexibility there for people to, to account for higher borrowing costs moving forward. And of course, the other factor that we need to think about when we're thinking about uh, increasing borrowing costs, this rate tightening cycle versus what we've seen in the past is the existence of the OSFI stress test. Because, you know, if you qualified for a mortgage two days ago before the Bank of Canada interest rate hike, technically you're still going to qualify today <clears throat> because you're being qualified at five and a quarter percent. Right, not at your contract borrowing costs. And so it's going to be very interesting to see, given this stricter uh, uh, qualification standard that we've been living under over the last few years, um, if, that, if that leads to perhaps a more muted impact uh, of interest rate hikes when we're talking about the, uh, the, the contract rate. And so certainly something to, to keep tabs on, to pay attention to in the coming months. And so the bottom line, when we're thinking about the outlook for, for home ownership demand, over the next year. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we could see a bit of give back because some households have, have pulled forward their, their, their purchase intentions. But at the same time, that's gonna be mitigated by increased immigration and, and a labor market that's gonna to continue to improve, to continue to create jobs um, as we move forward. Um, obviously, there will be somewhat of a mitigating effect uh, uh, from, uh, from, from higher borrowing costs. But again, it remains to be seen you know, how much of that uh, will feed through into, into people's decisions to, to, to purchase a home just because of the existence of the OSFI stress test um, as, as, we, uh, as we move through 2022. And we already started to see some of this uh, um, feed through into purchasing intentions when Ipsos uh, surveyed consumers at the end of last year. 
Um, because when we asked them, are you intending on purchasing a home over the next year in the fall of 2021, we had seen overall buying intentions uh, dip a little bit, certainly from what we'd seen um, in the in the fall of, of, of 2020. So again, um, you, you're already starting to see some of those uh, you know, buying intentions uh, dip, likely because a lot of households had already purchased a home um, as we move through 2021 and, and simply weren't intending on doing so over the next year. But you know, there's an important subset of, 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 of purchasing intentions, and that's first-time buyers, people moving into the housing market, the ownership market, as it were, um, for the first time. And not surprisingly, over the last few years, we have seen overall uh, first-time buying intentions trend lower in the GTA, and a lot of that has to do um, with, with higher costs, with, 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 uh, and, and certainly a lot of that's been brought on on the supply side of the market. But interestingly, if you look at first-time buying intentions in the City of Toronto, the 416 area code, uh, we actually saw those strengthen. And I think a lot of that has to do um, with an acceleration in demand for condominium apartments over the past year. The condo segment was hit hardest, um, in the early days of the pandemic, uh, but it's actually ex experienced a very strong resurgence, especially in the second half of last year and continuing on into 2022. And so that'll be an important market segment to watch um, in terms of purchase intentions this year. Um, and again, you know, the homes most likely to purchase, you know, we continue to see very strong demand for, for detached home types. And I think that that um, feeds a lot into that sort of spread of buying activity into the broader GGH, because if affordability is an issue in that detached market segment in the GTA, you may look further afield, especially uh, as people have had more flexibility in terms of, of, of place of work. Um, and just important to point out um, in, in relation to the last slide, if you look at condominium apartment purchase intentions up in the 416 area code uh, compared to what we had seen uh, in the fall of 2020. Now, some final discussion on the on the demand side of things, because you know we've heard a lot uh, about uh, government policies or prospective government policies, especially as you move towards the provincial and municipal elections in 2022. Uh, you know things like taxes on foreign buyers, looking at quelling speculation in the marketplace. But it's important to understand that foreign buying and speculation represent a fairly small share of overall transactions. And so what this chart here points out is just the number of transactions over the past number of years that were subject to the non-resident speculation tax that was brought in in conjunction with the fair housing plan by the previous provincial government. Uh, and the number of transactions on a monthly basis is in, is in the hundreds. Uh, so very low from, a, from a, a percentage perspective, hovering in at about 1% or even lower. And so if we took all those transactions out of the market, it would have a negligent impact on months of inventory, uh, you know, hundreds of a, of, a, of a percentage point, essentially, as you move through months of inventory. And so that's not the answer um, to, to seeing more affordable housing and more balanced market conditions in the, in the, uh, in, in the GTA and broader greater Golden Horseshoe. A similar story goes when you're thinking about speculative activity. And so what this chart shows is the, the number of sales uh, a number of properties that were sold that had a previous transaction within a 12-month window. Um, and so a purchase, uh, and then it turns over again within that 12-month period. And again, you're talking about transactions on an annual basis in the low thousands. So a very small percentage when you're talking about you know, over 120,000 transactions reported through TREB's MLS system last year. And similarly, if you took all of those transactions out of the market through some policy means, it would have a negligible impact um, on, uh, on, on market conditions, in this case shown here with, uh, with months of inventory. The market conditions would still be very tight. Why? The real issue is supply, and, and Richard mentioned it. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an issue that has compounded and gotten worse over time to the point where we only had 3,200 active listings on TREB's MLS system at the end of 2021. That was the handoff into 2022, 3,200 transactions, a record low, and certainly goes a long way to explaining why we're still experiencing you know, double-digit price growth on a year-over-year -year basis through the first two months of this year. The real problem is a lack of inventory, um, and governments are taking note. Uh, but uh, but I will quickly point out, you know, a, a study by Scotia Bank that uh, that came out over the last uh, year, and was certainly referenced in the in the provincial government report that Richard spoke to um, earlier. Um, but we've been a laggard in terms of home production, uh, uh, home production in Canada versus to our, our G7 counterparts in Ontario. 
we've been a laggard compared to other provinces. And so that's important when you think about the housing deficit that we're experiencing right now, but also the requirement for housing as the population continues to grow as a result of immigration. Um, and so the bottom line is that governments have taken note, they have acknowledged the supply issue. Um, and, and so that's exciting because if we were having this conference three or four years ago, we'd still be debating whether we needed more foreign buying taxes, more speculation taxes. And, and, and the suggestion would be that, you know, the supply issue is more of a red herring. Um, I think we put that to bed, but the issue is, is that you know, we're, we're still not seeing a lot of more supply on the ground. And if you look at people, uh, their intentions to list a home, it's essentially flatlined and even trended lower over the last couple of years. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that, you know, people could easily sell their home today. There's a lot of demand out there for ownership housing. It's a lot uh, 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 harder, though, to find another home that meets your needs once you sell the one you're in. And so a lot of people are just saying, you know what, I'm going to stick it out where I am. Maybe I'll undertake renovations. Um, but I'm certainly not going to move because it's, you know, near on impossible in a lot of neighborhoods throughout the city to find another home that meets your, your needs. And so the bottom line is, is that we expect to see very strong price growth continue through 2022, double digit price growth moving forward, certainly over $1.2 million average selling price throughout the GTA. And that's just because ownership housing demand is going to remain strong. The population is going to continue to grow. We're not going to save or, or solve this, the, the housing supply problem overnight. So we're going to continue to see a lack of listing inventory, which will lead to a, a further unwillingness to, to list. The only thing that, that could see uh, a bit of a ceiling on, uh, on, on price growth is just sort of qualification levels as we do see higher borrowing costs. But again, as I mentioned earlier, it remains to be seen how much higher contract borrowing costs uh, how much impact that will have on the market given the current OSCE stress test where people are being qualified at five and a quarter percent. The final slide I have is on the rental market. Um, you know, we, we've talked a lot about the lack of inventory for ownership housing. Well, that lack of inventory also exists on the rental front. We saw, you know, a brief spike in active uh, rental listings. If you look at uh, the, the, the orange line on this chart, that's gone right back down to sort of pre-pandemic norms. And so arguably, you know, when you look at the vacancy rate uh, moving forward, we'd also expect that to move back down to pre-pandemic norms as well over the next, you know, two to three years as the population continues to go and a component um, of that population growth find its way into the rental market. And that's why we started to see an acceleration in rental growth uh, through the fourth quarter of last year, double digit growth for one bedroom and two bedroom condominium apartments. And so I hope this helps sort of set the stage of, of where we are and what the handoff was into 2022. And I think, you know, this type of information, um, you know, sets us up well to, to discuss, you know, potential policies moving forward, especially as you move into the provincial and, and municipal election cycles later this year. So with that, I will um, turn it back to, um, to the group, and I'm not sure if there's any questions coming through. Uh, we have a couple of minutes here. Um, just sort of looking at some of the questions that came in here. I mean, just an overall question, will there be a discussion uh, uh, if the homeownership bridge partnership program, program headed by the, the CMHC um, will help with home ownership? Well, I think as we move through the, uh, the, the, the program today, there certainly will be a discussion both at the, at the provincial and broader federal level um, in terms, of, uh, in terms of, uh, of, of housing affordability. Um, another question here is if Canada has basically the same ratio of housing units to the population as the United States, and this ratio is the purpose cause of rising house price, why does the U.S. have a similar? Well, I, I'd argue differently. I mean, when, when you look at the U.S. case in, the, in a lot of centers around uh, the U.S., especially those that have been, been growing very quickly, thinking about California, parts of Texas, and parts of the eastern seaboard as well, um, you know, they're, they're experiencing a, a similar scenario uh, where we've had to see uh, government intervention on the, on the supply front. And I think, in fact, as we move through the program today, um, you know, we're going to also talk about uh, the situation south of the border and, and measures that have been taken to, uh, to um, uh, deal, with, uh, deal with supply issues in the, in the United States as well. Um, but I, I, I've been given a message that, uh, you know, we've reached time. 
Um, so what I want to encourage you to do is, is in the HOVA platform, you'll want to leave this segment uh, and then move over to the, the keynote portion of, uh, of today's event. So again, thank you very much for your time today and, uh, uh, and I look forward to speaking with you all in the future.